want to um, invite you to close your eyes because I want to stay in this moment. And as you close your eyes, I want you to hear these words. These words are from the Lord for you. Your mercy. Your mercy. I stand before my King and I bow my heart to sing. You save me. You raise me. You died so I could live. No greater love than this, your mercy. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let me just pray for us. God, thank you for your mercy for your mercy that overwhelms us, that redeems us and that saves us, that we can be found inside this great love of yours. May we live in mercy and in grace and in your love. Thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to go ahead and be seated. Now, those words that uh, I read from the end of Romans chapter 8 are what we talked about last week. If you were here last week, you got to hear Pastor Sherry uh, share an incredible message, uh, wrapping up uh, three weeks on Romans 8. If you didn't get a chance to to watch it, um, I'll encourage you to go online, find it on the website, on YouTube, uh, and find it, because it's incredible. And it finished with this idea, right, that, that nothing separates us from God's love. And this, this is the best news ever. This is what we've been talking about all throughout our study of Romans and what Paul is trying to tell us. And so we have this incredible, incredible news, this big, big news. And I think Paul, he understands how big this news is, but he's also got the the big picture in front of him. Because the, the church in Rome that he's speaking to, is, is full of a lot of Gentile Christians, and there's a few Jews. And so he's, he's been sharing this message about this good news, the gospel, of what it means to, to follow Jesus, what he's done for us, that he's trustworthy with your life. And likely, many of the Gentile Christians who are there are, are hearing that and going, that's fantastic, but you know, what about God's faithfulness to his people, to, to these Jews that we have here? Because it, maybe it seems like he hasn't been faithful. And so, Paul's got this big picture in front of him, where on the one hand, he's got God's incredible mercy, his incredible grace, his incredible love, but on the other hand, he's got this picture of Israel, God's people, being rejected. And Paul's going to focus on this for a while. So listen to what he has to say in the beginning of Romans chapter 9. This is God's word for us this morning. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Paul's holding this picture of mercy and rejection, and he longs for his people to not be separated from this great love of Christ. Scripture tells us that that cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. And Paul, his desire is so strong that he goes, I want to be like my Savior in that way, that I myself would be cursed and cut off, that just maybe some of my people, my people could actually know who the Messiah actually is. And the beautiful thing about Paul was that he he ended up practically doing this with his life, the way that he spent it, the way that he uh, just received uh, abuse and rejection on himself to go to Rome and to eventually die for this gospel. Paul believed that the good news for him must be good news 
for others. And it's the same with you and I. That if the good news is good for me, it must be good news for those in my life. And so Paul, he laments. I have anguish. I have unceasing sorrow in my heart. And if I'm honest, I have to tell you, I don't remember the last time that I actually lamented somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe I need to follow his example a little bit more. Because we have people in our lives who need the gospel. And like Paul, we need to consider what we're willing to do to share the gospel with people. See, as a, as a pastor, um, I get the privilege and the joy of being able to share it with you, with, with many of the students in my youth ministry. But oftentimes what can happen for, for people in my position is that we get into a little Christian bubble where a lot of it is, well, you already know. You've already accepted. You've already made a decision. I'm encouraging you. I'm shepherding you. Um, I can be in this bubble where I don't really have that many opportunities to share with those who are outside unless I'm intentional about it. You know that uh, Ralph and I and others play disc golf, um, and I've been able to to find this group of people um, outside the church. There's one guy in particular that I've befriended. His name's Alex. Um, And I have no idea what what God is going to do, but I'm, I'm trying to be faithful to go, okay, do I lament over the fact that he's not in in Christ. Okay, I'm going to do everything that I can. Okay, you need me to pick you up so we can go play disc golf so I can have some time with you? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm trying to be intentional about this because it needs intentionality from us to consider what we are willing to do to share the gospel with people. And let me tell you, if you are here in this room, your coworkers, your family, your neighbors, you've got incredible spheres of influence where you can share the gospel. And I hope that you're encouraged to do that. Now, whether it's new people in your life, that coworker, that neighbor, um, or maybe there's somebody in your life, a family member, a child, a friend, maybe who grew up in the church, maybe who you know knows the truth, knows this gospel message. And maybe at one time they believed it, maybe they didn't, but for whatever reason, they've left the church. And it causes a question to rise up within us. Is this good news really good enough? Did God somehow fail? Paul anticipates this question in regard to Israel, to the original recipients of the promise. And he says in verses 6 through 8, It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children. But it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So what was the promise? Paul names it. It's that, you know, God says to, to Abraham and Sarah, hey, Sarah, next year I'm going to return and you are going to have a son, which was a fulfillment of the promise that God made through his call to Abraham's life, that Abraham would be a blessing to all nations. So the promise was about blessing, but not in an abundance of treasure or possessions, but rather the blessing is an invitation to life with God to trust in him, to accept his love and his grace and his mercy. But Abraham and Sarah, even even though they received right directly from the Lord this promise, they tried to do life without God. And they said, hey, this is taking too long. You know, okay, you know what? So let's take it into our own hands. Um, I mean, we think that God's good, but, you know, he's he's waiting a long time. So um, Sarah goes, Abraham, hey, we got Hagar over here. Let's have a son that way taken the promise into their own hands, life without God. And they give birth to Ishmael. Now, what what Paul, I believe, is, is overall trying to say here is that there is an Israel inside of Israel. There is a true spiritual Israel who are not just the beneficiaries of the promise, but rather they are the bearers of it to others. They are meant to bring it to the world, this idea of life with God. 
Now, we all love being beneficiaries of good things. Let's take Christmas, for example, uh, from just, you know, not even two months ago. So, growing up in my house, um, we had big Christmases. My parents were, were so generous with me and my siblings. And uh, as, a, as a child, right, you are kind of the main beneficiary, right? Um, the blessings are poured out on you. And it feels wonderful. It feels great. But I can tell you this. I know this is true, and, and they're watching right now. My parents, as the bearers, as the bringers of the blessing, felt more blessed by being able to give it to their kids than what we were by receiving it. Jesus told us this very thing himself. He says, it's better to give than to receive. So the idea here is that by being a a bearer, a bringer of the good news, I am blessing others. And by by bringing it to others, it's not like, you know, I've been given $100 and I'm told give that $100 away and now I'm left with nothing. We can worry that by being the bringer to somebody else that I lose out on the benefit. But it's actually the other way around. When a beneficiary doesn't become a bearer, they become bankrupt. And when this happens, we miss the whole point. And Israel had missed the point of the promise, and therefore ended up missing the son, Jesus, who was the true fulfillment of the promise. So if we're not careful, we we can make the same mistake as them. See, the gospel is good news for us to bring to others. In our culture, though, we have a tendency to, to say this sentence a little bit differently. We like to say it, the gospel is good news for us. Or the gospel is good news for me, and we end it there. But if I'm just the beneficiary and not the bearer, bringing the good news of Jesus, of life with God, then this becomes distorted into comfort, power, money. And this is not healthy for us. So in in tracing the way that uh, this promise plays itself out throughout Israel's history, Paul goes on and he mentions Jacob and Esau. So remember, Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, Isaac is the, the son of the promise. And Isaac has Jacob and Esau. And in verses 11 and 12, Paul writes this. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. So while Paul is demonstrating God's purpose, it raises the question of his fairness. Because if, if one is favored over the other before they're even born, like, is, is God fair? So he addresses this in verses 14 and 15. And he says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. He goes on in verses 16 to 18 to talk about the dynamic between Moses and Pharaoh and what God was doing in that story. And simply put, Paul is telling us here that it is not unjust for God to show mercy to those who are undeserving and for God to harden those who harden themselves. Now, outside of Scripture, um, when when God specifically says, uh, hey, I harden somebody, or this is what I do, um, it's hard to know. Is God hardening me? Like, like what's going on? It's a subjective experience. And as I look back on my own life, I, I, I was examining, like, is there a place where maybe this has happened, where I've received mercy? Yes, but was there a place where God was doing something harder, more difficult than that? And I think back to my time in, in college. And if you're a kid in here, you've heard this story. If you're a leader in here, you've heard this story. Um, I've, I've told it a thousand times. But I went to college, and I didn't really care about succeeding. Um, I just I made it through the threshold, the finish line of high school, and I was happy with that. So I made it to college, and I just, I was stubborn. I might show up to class. Um, I'd rather hang out with my friends. And I just kind of stayed in this cycle of 
no, I'm not gonna put in the work. I skipped finals. Um, I, I, I wouldn't go to classes. I, I just wouldn't do anything, all the while knowing that I'm gonna bring home nothing but Fs, um, and that this is gonna hurt me, and it has, um, still paying for it. But I can tell you this. It took me seven years to get through college. I graduated with a 2.03 GPA, and I struggled to find a job out of college. But that led me to a place where I got to be trained by some, some ministry giants who said, we see the potential in you, and, and no, yeah, you don't have another job, that you've had some hard times, we want to train you and launch you out into ministry. And that became my first full-time job in ministry and has led me on the path where I am here today. And so I can tell you that if it wasn't for my experience in college, I would not be here today. I needed to fail, to get kicked out of college, to work hard. And I don't know, but I think maybe I could have kicked myself out of it a little bit sooner, but I don't think that would have been good for me. So maybe, just maybe, was God doing something in me that I was already doing myself to say, I've got bigger plans for you. There's going to be something that I'm going to do in and through you so that I might be the recipient of both his mercy and maybe of his hardening. Now, we're all fans of the idea of mercy, but we often stumble and struggle over this idea of, of being hardened, especially if I had no choice, like it was my destiny, like I couldn't do anything else but end up here. But listen to this. The, the truly perplexing thing, the, the, the truly wondrous thing in the midst of this about the good news is not that some are saved and some aren't, that some receive mercy and some don't, but rather that any are saved at all. This is a profound mystery. God does not have to offer us his mercy, and yet he chooses to. Which means that God's mercy and his judgment are not at odds with each other, but are in fact compatible with his justice and his ways. But this can make it seem like we have no choice, right? That either we're the recipients of his mercy or the recipients of judgment. And God has chosen which one he is going to give us before we ever had a choice, right? This, this sounds unfair. So why are we then on the hook? Why does God hold us responsible if, if it's all about what he's doing? And, and Paul, right, he, he recognizes this in verse 19. He says, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? Now, we all like to do this, right? We all like to shift the blame. Um, we've been doing this ever since Adam pointed to Eve, and we still do it today. But Paul, he asks us, who are you to talk back to God? God is the potter. You are clay. He has the right to do with the clay what he wants. Now, if we're not careful, we can interpret this, I think, not the way that Paul intended. Paul's not saying you can't engage with God with sincere questions, with doubt, with struggles. We actually have scriptural basis for people doing that with God. God comes to Abraham and he says, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to you know, take out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, well, hold on. What, what about this? And he talks back to God. I don't think Paul is, is saying that we can't do that. In the youth ministry, in, in times past, um, we might go on a retreat, a trip, a mission trip, or whatever, and something that I like to say to kids, if I can remember it, is, um, hey, you've got these rules for kind of helping you to have success. There's these regulations, these things that we want you to, to do. We focus more on the do these things, not the don't do these things, um, but these are going to help you have success. And if you ever have a question about any of them, I want you to feel the freedom to ask myself, ask one of the leaders. Okay, you can question why you're being asked to do this. Okay? But here's what I want you to do. Ask it while you're on the way to go do it. Right? Like, I want to invite that question, that engagement, but show that you're, you're obeying, that you're willing to surrender and, and, and admit that maybe there's something bigger, but you want to find out along the way. I think maybe this is a better picture of what Paul is saying that we can do. There's a difference between that and rebuking. 
If I had a kid that came up to me and just said, that's dumb, you're dumb, you know, get, get thee behind me, I'm going to be like, hold on now. We're going to have some problems. We can rebuke God and tell him he doesn't know what he's doing. Or we can come to him and say, help me understand. So I think Paul is trying to paint a better picture of what our relationship with God is. And he does this by showcasing God's character, his purposes, and his justice. Then in verses 22 through 29, he ends up relating all of this back to the Jews and to the Gentiles and what God is doing, what his purposes are. He quotes Isaiah and he quotes Hosea and he points to God's inclusion of the Gentiles, but also to the rejection of Israel, save for a remnant. So this all ends up coming together in the last three verses where we ask the question, so what? Paul says this. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written. See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So Paul is saying that the Jews who pursued righteousness never obtained it. And the Gentiles who did not pursue it had actually laid hold of it. We cannot make what we do our reason for righteousness. When it's about us and our accomplishments, our name, our success, what we earn, our effort, then it means that Christ died for nothing. And we rob the best news ever of being any good. But I find two truths at work here, and they can sometimes seem like they are at odds with each other. The first truth is this, that I am beloved of God. And I need to hear this. We're living in hard times where mental health issues are on the rise. And we need to be reminded and spoken into with these positive messages about our identity and our worth. But what can happen here is that we can take this idea and we can run with it. And we can build ourselves up. Where it's no longer about receiving God's love, that I'm beloved of God. It's that I am worthy and I'm good enough in what I do and my name and my accomplishments. And I've got what, what it takes. And while these are positive messages, what we can do is conflate our sense of righteousness. And we begin to think that maybe we're worthy because of what we've done. And so therefore you owe me. The other idea, the second one is this. I have nothing to offer. I'm beloved of God. I have nothing to offer. And if we're not careful with this second truth, this can feel crushing. I think the church in some places has gotten a bad reputation for focusing on this in a destructive, demoralizing, soul-crushing way. That we can begin to think that I am worthless. Who could ever love me? Why should I show up? Why should I care? Where do I belong? Where do I fit? I, I'm just, I'm pointless. There's nothing for me. And we end up devaluing the very thing that Christ died to save. But this idea of I have nothing to offer, I think was the very thing that the Jews were stumbling over. And we too can trip over it today because we so badly want to earn, to succeed, to work, to grow our name and our accomplishments and all the benefits that they bring. But God, he has laid this rock down before each and every single one of us. And we all must decide what to do about it to stumble over it, 
holding on to our pride, our ego, our arrogance, our sense of our own righteousness, or we can learn to stand upon it. A firm foundation. And to stand on it, we're actually keeping these two seemingly maybe opposing ideas in balance with each other. Allowing them to become like two gears rotating in opposite directions, which actually springs our faith into action. You, church, are beloved of God. But not because of what you can offer. Not because of your goodness or what you can accomplish. But by his incredible great mercy demonstrated for you in Christ. This, this is the great surrender of our lives. To daily let go of effort. To daily let go of our pride. To daily let go of our success. To daily let go of my name so that I can embrace his in my life. So that I can do life on his terms with him, seated with him. Trusting in his promises. This is what we need to do every day. And this table here behind me, it represents an opportunity for us to live into this, to make another decision about what we're going to do with Christ. Because here's the truth, church. Whether you've decided about Christ 10 years ago, 30 years ago, or you've yet to decide, we all have to make a decision every single day. Because my pride, my arrogance, my sense of righteousness, my wanting to do life on my own wants to override everything else. And so this table, it, it represents something significant. It, it lives in the space between Jesus as a servant, washing his disciples' feet, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness. He serves, he humbles himself completely. It's found between his service and his surrender on a cross for you and I in his great mercy. And so when we take and observe this meal, we recognize that it's not about us, that it is a free gift of God and that I need to do this every day. I need to surrender. I need to accept his mercy and I need to be willing to take this mercy to those around me. Let's pray over this meal right now. God, we admit that we sometimes get confused. We sometimes mix messages. We mix ideas. We take things too far. We have a oftentimes wrong view of ourselves and a not a big enough view of who you are, of your incredible mercy and of your incredible grace. So God, as we come to this table, God, we bring all of our arrogance, our pride, our selfishness of wanting to just keep things to ourselves, to keep life to ourselves and not actually share it and surrender it with you. We bring all these things before you. Say, please take them. Help us to surrender, that we might stand upon the rock that says we are beloved with nothing to offer and that makes you that much greater. In Jesus we pray, amen.